Okay, thanks everyone for staying with us. And if you are just joining us, welcome to session two of day two of Evaluate, Assessment Solutions, Greater Data, Greater Impact. For this session, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Tammy Stevens. Dr. Stevens is the Clinical Product Support and Training Manager for Riverside Insights. She received her doctorate in special education with an emphasis in assessment from Texas Women's University. She is an educational diagnostician, assistant professor, and former special education teacher. She has written multiple peer-reviewed journal articles focusing on topics including dyslexia and dysgraphia evaluations and the importance of considering exclusionary factors. Since I am also a presenter for the session, I'm gonna take the opportunity to introduce myself briefly as well. Again, my name is Sarah Holman. I'm the Clinical Product Marketing Director here at Riverside Insights. And prior to joining Riverside last fall, I spent over 20 years in the public education setting, working as a bilingual teacher, educational diagnostician, dyslexia coordinator, and special education coordinator. Um, again, during the presentation, please leave any questions you may have in the Q&A box. A recording of today's presentation and certificate of attendance will be sent to all registrants by the end of next week. And now I will pass it off to Dr. Stevens to get us started. All right. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. Real excited to be here. I want to, first of all, start off by welcoming you back to your new school year. I know... Um, I want to send out some kudos to each and every one of you for what you do every day for our students. Um, I know that um, you guys are making such a, uh, uh, an enormous impact on um, our students, our students' lives. And I know that the last few years have been extremely taxing um, for you guys with everything that's been going on as far as the, the pa pandemic. Um, it's been very overwhelming with um, everything. Um, and then also with uh, the, you know, the school closures, the um, virtual instruction that's been happening. Um, and then also we've got a lot of states that are updating their policies. Um, they're adjusting some of their guidance and there, there's been an increase in, in parent referrals over the years. And what we've been hearing a lot um, from evaluators is there's been a lot of burnout um, of the evaluators and the teachers due to some of these things that's going on. So um, unfortunately, we've had a lot of evaluators leave the field, um, have, re have uh, retired, but we're, ex we're excited that you're here and you're sticking with it. And we're hoping that you're gonna have a, a better um, school year. And um, one of the things that we're trying to do here at Riverside is to provide you with resources, um, some guidance that's really gonna help kind of um, simplify your assessment uh, process. We're gonna provide you with some resources that's gonna help um, you organize um, your assessment to be very deliberate and very uh, 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 purposeful in the way that you move forward with your assessment. So that's kind of what we're gonna talk about today. Some of the assessment solutions that's been created for you guys as you move forward with using um, our, um, our tests. So, we wanna start off actually with a poll, first of all. And what we wanna do is, you know, given um, the information, all the stuff that you guys have been dealing with over the years um, and thinking about this upcoming school year, we're wondering what you uh, see as your most pressing challenge or um, what you anticipate being your most pressing challenge of the school year. And, and, and this is in, in, um, in relation to your assessment practices, et cetera. So what, do you, what is your most pressing challenge? And then, uh, or what do you anticipate uh, facing this school year um, that could be challenging for you? So we're gonna um, put a poll up for you to go th uh, through and look at that and, and choose, um, which one, which of those um, options that would uh, would indicate your number one challenge? Okay. Give you a little bit of time to respond. Okay. 
there's still responses coming in, so I'm just going to give it another few seconds. Okay. Okay, it looks like everyone who wants to respond has responded, about 50. 8% response, 59, still getting a few more responses. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll. Okay. And I'm going to share the results. Okay, can you see the results? I don't see them. I I can. So it looks like the increase in referrals came in um, in the number one spot with 37% of the vote, um, followed closely by staffing shortages with 30%, um, vague or unclear referral concerns, 18%, and disruptions in learning with 9%. Other uh, had a 5% response rate. So if you responded other and you want to or feel comfortable doing so, drop in the chat what that other reason might be, just so we can sort of get an idea of, of other things that you all are facing um, for this school year. Yeah, and it'll be helpful for us to get that information too, because as we move forward with planning additional professional development opportunities like this, we can kind of take this information to help um, incorporate and incorporate it into our um, into our webinars, et cetera. So, um, you know, the challenge is as we're talking to uh, evaluators um, across the country, we're seeing uh, very much the same uh, feedback. There's been a lot of um, a, a huge increase in the number of referrals that have been coming in. And a lot of these are really due to um, some of the, as you can imagine, some of the implications from COVID, um, et cetera. And that kind of goes back to that, those disruptions in learning. But so also some of the uh, increased referrals have been um, through parent referrals. So we're getting a lot more parents that are uh, asking schools to refer or, or to uh, assess their children um, to determine um, if there is a, a learning disability, et cetera. We also, we're also seeing um, those staffing shortages. So throughout the country, um, in addition to evaluators, but also teachers, unfortunately, um, as I've mentioned, have left the field um, and there's not enough staff to take up the slack. And, you know, we're gonna have some uh, major ramifications from this, specifically with um, our districts that are uh, having difficulty um, staffing the classrooms with highly qualified teachers, um, et cetera. So um, we have to kind of think about as we're talking about exclusionary factors of these students who are being referred in the future, we have to look at what type of educational um, instruction they've received and has it been th uh, from a highly qual qualified individual. So that's something that is also with these staffing shortages in, in, as it pertains to evaluators, it's also going to result in a lot of cases in increased uh, caseloads um, for evaluation uh, of evaluators. We're also seeing um, that there's a lot of issues happening with the referral process itself. And um, a lot of the presentations that Dr. Holman and myself do is around being um, very purposeful and targeted in the way that we move forward with our assessment practices. And it's very difficult to do this when we receive uh, referral packets that are vague, or unclear, or they have these broad referral concerns. So, um, you know, oftentimes we have, um, and we receive these referral packets that have everything checked off, the child cannot do anything, or, you know, uh, very unclear types of information provided, very little sources, of, multiple sources of data being provided in the referral packets. Um, and then again, they may have the student um, having um, issues in both you know, reading and writing and, and or reading and, and um, math, and not that they can't have um, issues in those areas. Sometimes what we find though, is if we take in the information, more information as part of that referral, we go back and collect some data, really organize it and analyze it, we find that sometimes the data tells us a very different story. 
But when we focus only on those broad, those vague referral concerns, and we use those to um, drive our assessment, that's when we end up in these situations where we're over testing students. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that on, um, on the next slide. But the over testing of, of, the, of the students um, is typically a result of having these, these vague, broad referral concerns because when we don't know where the issue really is, we're, we end up testing everything. And, um, you know, one of my hypotheses around this is that um, specifically when we, we have referrals for specific learning disabilities, I think we need to do a better job of educating our gen ed um, uh, uh, colleagues, our, our um, principals, our assistant principals, et cetera, in what a specific learning disability truly is. And making sure that they understand when we go back and we look at policy, just like the previous um, presenter mentioned, when we look at policy, we're supposed to be looking at multiple sources of data, not just one data point when we're making decisions. So it's important that when we get these referral packets that we have good uh, data uh, of actual students' performance that relates, uh, ties directly back to the, um, the curriculum, back to classroom instruction, et cetera. And we should use that to help target and drive our use of the norm reference tests. Because the last thing we want to do is get in there and over test our kiddos. So I think part of the challenge is for us to get out there and get in front of the, these individuals to um, provide them with the overview and the explanation as to why their information that's being included in the referral packet is just as important as the other information that we pull in as part of our assessment. Um, I think a lot of times our, um, our colleagues are working from this old mentality of our testing, our administration of a test is what determines eligibility when in fact it's all the data together. Our norm reference test gives us important information, but it has to be uh, incorporated with the other uh, data sources um, that were collected on the student when we make these um, eligibility decisions. So one of the things that um, we have, uh, Dr. Holman and I have been trying to do is really get a good um, pulse of what is or um, are those current testing practices um, in the field. And one of the things, as I just mentioned, is we're seeing a lot of over-testing of, of students. And I call it either the kitchen sink approach to testing, where if we throw everything in there, you know, we're gonna find, uh, find something, or the standard protocol approach to testing. So that's where, and no matter what the referral question is, no matter if it's an initial or reeval, every child gets the same number of tests. And what we've typically seen is that typically, these tests are, um, we're, we're giving two tests in every area, right? So it's not uncommon for us to hear from evaluators that kid, kid, uh, students are being administered 45 tests. That's a lot of testing, right? And we have to merge that information that we obtain from those 45 tests with the other data, right? To make sense and, and interpret and uh, determine whether the child meets the eligibility criteria. What we're advocating for is a more targeted uh, way of moving forward with our, our testing. Um, and that's what we're gonna present today is some of those resources that have been created by Dr. Holman um, and Dr. Grant to provide you with some guidance on how to really be selective in the way that you uh, move forward with um, your testing. The other thing we're finding in the field um, is that interpretations are being made about students' results on these tests by looking at standard scores alone, okay? And that's how we've traditionally been taught to use these tests, right? We, we look at the standard scores, we see if those standard scores are within the average, low average, um, high average range, uh, whatever. But that standard score, we have to remember, is one piece of the data, first of all. We also have to remember that that standard score is an ordinal scale, right? It's telling us that students place in line 
in relation to the, the normative sample. So um, looking at that, nor that normal curve and looking at where that student's, that 92 um, falls out on that normal curve. That standard score alone does not tell the whole story. So there's so much rich information that's provided um, with, uh, through the use of these tests that are, is often left on the table. One of those um, um, really important pieces of, of data that is provided by the, the WJ, the WMLS, the BDI, is, a, is what's called a relative proficiency index score. And that relative proficiency index score is different than the standard score. Where the standard score tells us that students place in line, the relative proficiency index score actually describes the student's functioning. It describes the student's proficiency on those tasks on which you have um, uh, tested the student. So in reality, that relative proficiency index score oftentimes is better aligned with what the teacher is seeing in the classroom than what that standard score uh, is. And there are two different measures, there are two different ways, two different lenses in which we can look at students' performance. Um, but it is one of those unique measures that make up the WJ, the WMLS, um, ECAD, et cetera, um, that's not available in some of the other tests. I think this is one of the hidden jewels of the WJ, if you will, because it does provide us with more information around functioning. We can look at, not only do we can we see how that student is functioning on uh, those uh, tasks. We can also um, look at the implications that students um, RPI, that student's performance has on the student or is predicted to have on the student in the classroom. And oftentimes if we, if we um, stop our interpretation at the standard score alone, we miss important information because there's times where the student could, could um, obtain a standard score of 92, but their RPI is actually showing a very different picture, okay? I know we're gonna offer some uh, additional webinars coming up on really focusing in on that RPI because that RPI is a really important, very valuable data point that, that should be, if you're you, when you're using our, our tests, the WJs, et cetera, you should be pulling that into your interpretation. Because ultimately what we wanna know when we go through these assessments is we really wanna know how is the student functioning in these um, particular um, area, skill areas, and what are the implications gonna be on that student in the classroom? The other thing uh, we often forget um, about is the task demands associated with the test. And I'm gonna talk a little more about those in, in a, a couple uh, future slides, but the task demand analysis is another way to inform your um, interpretation, inform decision-making regarding um, what that student needs to be um, uh, successful in the, in the classroom. There's times, again, where we have to remember, well, all, to, all the time we have to remember that these tests are not pure measures. There's a lot of overlapping of skills that go into these tests. So if we interpret from just, let's say, let's use the example of, um, let's say, applied problems. We think about applied problems, if we just interpret the results from the um, aspect of, oh yes, it's a measure of math calculation, it's a ma measure of uh, math problem solving, and we don't recognize that, oh, it does have language demands, it also is a measure of, of the, um, the quantitative, right? Um, fluid reasoning, et cetera. If we don't look at those types of things when we're interpreting the results, there's, you know, there's times where the child may be okay with calculation, but maybe there's a language issue that's impacting their performance on that particular test. The other thing about the task demands is it allows you to look at, as well, the input that's um, uh, provided to the student, if it's oral, visual, the output, how does the student respond, we can look at whether the task was timed or not and how the student performed on those. Um, we can also look at the language demands, um, et cetera. 
um, in addition to the task itself and the other skills that are required for that child to be successful. So task demand analysis is, is really uh, where we can go deeper into the interpretation so that we can um, uh, so we can make sense of, of the data. And then the lack of integration of, of testing data with other sources of data when decision making. So again, making sure we're going back to policy and incorporating that information um, into um, in with our testing data. Minimize incorporation of testing observations within the interpretation process. Remember that your testing observations play a crucial role when you are interpreting the results. So when the student has a low score in a particular area, we want to go back and look at what types of, of um, what types of information or uh, what types of strategies did the student engage in when they were uh, performing that task, et cetera. And then the other thing we were finding is limited linkage between assessment data and recommendations and instructional program. And we'll talk about when we get to uh, the end of the presentation, there's different tools out there that will allow you to make some direct linkages between your um, the student's assessment data and the recommendations. So again, it's important that we remember that when we are using the WJs, there's different levels of interpretation. And as we are uh, uh, assessing our students and analyzing the results, we have to remember that there's a lot of important information that we can pull into our analysis that goes deeper than just the standard score. So we've got our qualitative information, you know, these observations, We've got the level of development, um, there's those age and grade equivalents there, uh, proficiency, which is where we're looking at the um, RPIs, et cetera. And then we've got our relative standing in the group, and that's where we're looking at standard scores. Um, so we should be pulling in information um, from all of these different areas when we're interpreting the students' results. So we're going to talk a little bit about this idea of selective testing. I think it's going to sort of get to the heart of a lot of the concerns that were mentioned um, sort of as a result of the poll as, as well as what you know the previous presenter spoke about um, and how we can sort of make sure that we're getting um, the most relevant information that is going to be the most useful um, in terms of helping guide our instructional planning um, for the student. So this concept of selective testing can really help us um, sort of make sure that the tests we're giving are giving us sort of the biggest bang for our buck. So, so what is selective testing? Selective testing is the careful selection of instruments to further assess skill areas pertinent to the referral concerns when deemed necessary based on clinical judgment. So curating your sort of testing protocol, um, by curating that you, according to the unique needs of the individual, um, selective testing allows us as the examiner to obtain the most diagnostically useful information in the least amount of testing time. So it's a way, again, to sort of streamline the assessment process, make sure we're getting the most useful information out of our, out of our evaluations as possible. Um, selective testing practice can be conducted based on the presenting problem. So you can sort of select a test um, battery, so to say, um, based on the referral question, but it also can be conducted based on the sort of the functional profile that sort of reveals itself through the process of testing. So based on the pattern of strengths and weaknesses that emerges during the testing, you can then go in and select um, additional measures to sort of supplement your understanding of the student and provide additional information that can be useful for diagnostic purposes and educational uh, planning. So there are two sort of main um, benefits of selective testing and sort of how it can help us improve our practices and address again some of the challenges that we noted early on. Um, the first benefit is that it um, 
improves efficiency. So customizing your assessment plan really helps you to work more effectively, moving quickly through your testing backlog um, and allowing you to sort of use your time wisely um, by gathering the most relevant information about a student. So a more targeted approach sort of facilitates that data analysis, which ultimately is going to lead to, to richer and more robust intervention and program, program planning. Um, additionally, selective testing reduces test fatigue. As Dr. Stevens mentioned, sometimes we sort of engage in this sort of kitchen uh, sink approach where we're, we're administering a, a large quantity of, of tests to an individual student. And sort of that, that can lead to test fatigue by both the examiner and the examinee, um, which you know, can lead to some unintended errors in administration and scoring. Um, it can lead to frustration or lack of engagement from the examinee. And it also introduces increased um, variance. So the more tests you give, the higher likelihood of greater variability within the data, which can lead to more uncertainty, um, making that data analysis process more challenging and um, making you know, making meaningful inter interpretations and recommendations more, more difficult on you, the examiner. So the WJ suite of assessments is really sort of um, designed to, with this sort of selective testing approach in in mind. So they're not, these tests are not designed to be administered in its entirety. They are designed specifically for this approach of selective testing. So each of the tests are tests and not subtests. They're psychometrically sound enough to sort of stand alone as measures of a particular um, area or, or concept. Um, in each of the manuals, you will be able to see the selective testing table, which will give you an idea of which tests will um, allow you to assess for a particular area of concern or, or um, to better understand a particular area. And so as a result, there really are a strong measure to the WJ suite is really strong measure to serve as the foundation of our assessment solutions, which we'll talk about um, a little bit later on. Okay. So understanding what the test measures, again, we need to know that the, the tests that we select are gonna provide us with the most um, relevant um, components uh, for our referral concerns. So it's really key for us to be able to conduct this selective testing. And um, as uh, Dr. Holman mentioned, our tests are intended to be used in this manner. There was never any intention of each of all of the tests to be administered um, to um, each of the students that we assess. So when we look inside the um, we look inside the easels for the WJ COG, the achievement, oral language, et cetera, we have our selective testing table that we can use to help uh, guide our test selection. So, of course, the first seven of the COG gives us a general um, intellectual ability so we can assess overall intellectual development of the student. And it's also going to um, provide us with a measure of each of the uh, uh, seven broad uh, G uh, factors. Um, and we can use this information as the, pretty much as the foundation for our assessment um, and our testing plan. And then we can merge that information with other data to determine whether we need to go back and do a more uh, selective testing in a particular area. So when you're planning your assessment, we can go to the, this uh, selective testing table. We can look at those, the area, the reason for re referral, look at those areas of concern, and we can pick and choose those uh, tests that are uh, gonna provide us with the most relevant information needed to answer the referral question. The same is true for the achievement. We're looking at reading. We've got our, our reading uh, tests listed. You can see the different cluster areas that we can obtain um, at the top, and then it gives you a list of the different tests that you can administer. Your first six of the achievement is going to be the core. 
And once we give the core, we can go back and, and conduct more selective testing in areas where it's necessary. Um, but always remembering that we're going to merge this information with the other data that we've collected. The other thing um, that I mentioned earlier is thinking about what's in a test and remembering that these are not pure measures and that when we are looking at the student's results and we're interpreting the results, we have to consider um, all that's required, all the skills that are required in order for that, that student to uh, perform um, adequately on the test. And we have to recognize that there are different areas in which the student could struggle that could impact their uh, skills. So when we're looking at word attack um, from the WJ, it's requiring the achievement areas of reading, uh, writing ability, and, and reading uh, decoding, but it's also including some of the cognitive processes of auditory processing, phonetic coding, um, et cetera. And in addition to that, we have to consider the language demands associated with the test, the receptive and expressive. We have to think about the sensory input, the sensory output, and whether there's a time limit associated with the task. So what we advocate for is when you are interpreting your uh, students' results, um, we can go in um, if there um, are those areas in which that student has scored low, go in and look at the task demands to see if you can explain why the student scored low. Maybe it's not the actual task uh, that we're, um, that we're um, testing, but maybe it's one of those other areas um, uh, that are required for completion of that task. The other thing I wanted to point out is within the examiner's manual, we do have um, some guidance uh, with regards to uh, the skills that are measured. Um, and I pulled in the, the um, WJ achievement, the reading tests. So you can see here that they list those reading tests from less complex all the way up to more complex. And you can see the, the stimulus, you can see the tasks that's required, and you can see the, um, the tests that make up each of those um, areas. So that when you are looking at, again, looking at students' results um, and planning instruction, et cetera, we can see where the student is performing and then where we need to start our, our, our instruction and where we're gonna go from there. Or what is it that, you know, is there, are there some skills below that that the student's struggling with? And so what are some of those skills that we need to address uh, for the, the student? So again, I think it's really important that we recognize that there's a lot of additional information that these tests provide to us um, to really get a good, full, well-rounded picture of what the student can and cannot do. So as Dr. Stevens said, we're really committed here to providing um, evaluators and practitioners with the resources that they need um, to sort of streamline and make what they do um, every day for students ultimately more efficient. And one of the things that we've been developing are called assessment solutions. And basically these are multi-battery playbooks that um, combined various measures um, that utilize sort of this selective testing approach to help evaluators with an assessment by providing them an assessment roadmap to investigate a variety of conditions. So we'll look at the various components of each solution and then we'll sort of do a more in-depth walkthrough of the dyslexia solution. And so you can sort of see how we've applied sort of this selective testing approach to help you identify which tests and which tests on those measures would be the most relevant to a particular condition. So we can utilize these assessment solutions to strategize your testing plan really being purposeful in the measures that you're selecting to conduct your evaluation in order to get the results that you need to better understand the learner. Um, as a result, they'll sort of, this process makes your evaluations more effective and efficient um, by providing a list of tests that are most um, pertinent or most relevant to a particular condition or function. So there are um, three 
basic components to the assessment solutions and they're going to be they're housed on currently on um, a website and you can see there just a screenshot of the website and from that website you can access the three different components of the assessment solution so we'll go to the next slide and we'll look at each of those three components in a little bit more in depth so the first component of the solution is an assessment guide. This guide is going to describe how each test informs your comprehensive evaluation. So it starts with sort of an explanation of the condition. This is an example from the Early Childhood Guide for Evaluating Dyslexia and notes there that there are specific considerations for an assessment of for younger children when we're looking at dyslexia that might be a little bit different than if you're assessing an older child. So we really want to be focusing on those foundational skills for oral language, phonological awareness, rapid naming, letter recognition, that sound symbol association. And so those are the aspects of the evaluation that the guide is really going to help focus you in on. It lists uh, the, the um, instruments included in the guide and um, sort of uh, broken down by screener, a more comprehensive measure, and then if you need some additional testing, some additional measures that you could pull in if necessary. So that's sort of the first got, the first component of this assessment solution. The second component of the assessment solution is a score profile sheet. This is where you can sort of consolidate your formal testing data. There are um, space for you to put some qualitative observations, and it's a way to organize your data, which will help ultimately sort of help facilitate that analysis process and that interpretation process. So that's the second component. It's a sort of a score profile. And then the third component is, obviously, is just a list of products that go into the, um, the the guide. So this is an example from the English Learner Bundles, just so that you have an idea if there's a test that you would like to sort of supplement or augment your current testing toolkit, that is an easy um, way for you to find the information regarding that test. So let's look a little bit deeper in depth into the Dyslexia School Age 7 Plus solution. So again, it starts out sort of with this definition of dyslexia, and I've highlighted and underlined um, three sort of components of the definition because that is sort of what the bundle is built about. So if you think about the definition of dyslexia, there are sort of three basic components. You've got your academic characteristics, difficulty with uh, fluent or accurate word reading, spelling, um, secondary consequences for reading comprehension and um, written expression, Sort of that's sort of your first component of the definition. The second component um, of the definition is that the difficulties that the student is exhibiting in these academic skills are the result of difficulties with that phonological component of language. There's a, there's a deficit in, in phonological awareness, the, the, the understanding of sort of how the sound system of our language works. That's the fundamental difficulty for these kiddos. And so that's sort of the second component of the definition. And then the third component of the definition is that these difficulties that the student is experiencing are often unexpected. So it is a surprise to the teacher, to the parent, to the evaluator that the child is struggling in reading and, and spelling in a way that they are given the fact that they are performing adequately in other areas or have a particular set of skills that are very strong. And so something about their profile is, is surprising. They do demonstrate the ability to learn in the absence of the requirement to read. So those are sort of the three broad components of the definition of dyslexia. And it's the way we built the solution to help you kind of guide through the assessment process um, with that sort of framework. So in terms of that first component, the academic characteristics, this is a screenshot from the 7 Plus solution, and it walks you through the, the Wilcock Johnson Test of Achievement and how that test can help inform 
your understanding of that first component of the definition or the academic characteristics. We know that kids with dyslexia have difficulty with those basic reading skills, both word recognition and sort of decoding. So it highlights not only sort of the broad area of basic reading, but more specifically, what specific tests would be useful to administer a, a, a student that you're suspected of having the condition of dyslexia and how that sort of how that sort of informs your better understanding of the, their, their academic characteristics that are related to dyslexia. So it sort of follows through the, the main academic characteristics of basic reading, reading fluency, spelling, and then it talks about some secondary characteristics of reading comprehension and written um, expression, but it sort of identifies those aspects of the test that are most relevant to the identification of dyslexia. So rather than saying you can use the Woodcock-Johnson achievement to assess dyslexia, here are the specific components of the test that you're really going to make sure that to want to include in any assessment of suspected dys uh, dyslexia for a student that is age seven plus. And then the second um, area I'm going to highlight of the bundle is it has to do with the sort of underlying cause or that difficulty with the phonological component of language. And so here we are talking about the comprehensive test of phonological processing or the CTEP2, which is sort of considered sort of the gold standard of phonological processing when you're conducting a dyslexia um, evaluation. So we're Again, highlighting those specific areas of the test that are going to be relevant to administer for this suspected disability condition and how it might inform your understanding of a student's skills in that area. So it is included in this particular bundle because it's recommended for students second grade and up because it has the most items tapping phoneme manipulation. So phoneme manipulation is, is the most highly correlated skill to reading growth at this point within a child's development. And so that's why it was sort of selected again to be part of the seven plus bundle because it is going to give us sort of the most relevant and important information for a student at this time of their development. So if we're looking at the early childhood bundle, we may be recommending an, a, 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 or selecting a test of phonological processing that may be different due to the fact that we may be focusing in on different skills at that point in the child's um, sort of schooling development. And then the, the, just to highlight how we sort of looked at this, this, this aspect of unexpectedness. So we've identified some um, tests or areas that you could explore that are sort of will help you understand whether or not the student's difficulties in reading and written spelling are unexpected compared to their other abilities, which would demonstrate that they do have this ability to learn independent of reading. So for example, on the WJ4 achievement, you can tap the um, mathematics domain, both calculation skills and math problem solving. Although, you know, so lots of kids with dyslexia do have sort of concurrent difficulties with calculation, but it does identify that that may be an area of strength and may indicate that, you know, their reading difficulties are unexpected. So it gives you sort of a, 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 an idea of additional areas that you can tap to help you determine whether or not these difficulties are unexpected. Because as Dr. Stevens said, we wanna make sure that we're making these decisions based on a preponderance of, of, of data, not relying on one, one sole source alone. And so by looking at various um, skills, we can establish whether or not, so we have a preponderance of data to support the fact that this, these reading and spelling difficulties are unexpected in relation to their other abilities. Okay, 
So the other thing, like when we're actually uh, conducting these assessments, the one thing we, the the additional thing we want to do is, is ensure that we're linking our assessment results to instructional programming. So in addition to being targeted in the way that we move forward with our testing, using our selective testing, merging the information with other data, we want to take that assessment uh, data to really drive those interventions, those instructional programming um, uh, plans that we put together for our students. And one of the uh, uh, tools that we have with the Woodcock Johnson is the WIP, which is the Woodcock Johnson Interpretation and Instructional Interventions Program. And with the WIP, it provides you with not just for the WJ4, but also the ECAD, it provides you with a lot of uh, really um, comprehensive checklists that can be used to inc incorporate it into your referral, into your assessment. It's got information uh, checklists that include reason for referral. There's a parent checklist. There's a teacher checklist. There's a self checklist. Um, there's a writing scale, um, a, a writing evaluation, et cetera. And again, all of this can be used and should be used to really conduct a, this uh, this comprehensive assessment of the student. The other thing that I like to point out is that we do have a dyslexia report embedded within the WIP program. So it offers you the option to run a dyslexia report that will pull in those pertinent uh, data points so that you can have that information again to uh, merge with the other data for decision making. So, when we're thinking about streamlining our processes, we're thinking about um, being more efficient in the way that we assess our students, but also in ensuring that we're being very comprehensive in our approach. There are tools like the, the, w, the WIP that will allow for taking it to the next step, step and really tying the student's results to interventions and and there's a lot of evidence-based formative interventions that are integrated into the platform itself there's also I, I didn't add this here but there you should know there's also a similar type of program that's available for the um the woodcock munis language survey and that the wmls has a a, a similar type of intervention program um, along with some um, uh, recommendations for parents, um, et cetera. So be sure to check those out if that's not something that you're uh, currently um, familiar with. So the last thing we, we wanted to talk about in terms of resources that we are working um, on providing practitioners out in the field is a WJ training program. So we know that depending on where you are in your journey, um, you may be perfectly fluent, very adept at the administration of all of these assessments. Some of you, it may have been a while since grad school and you could use a refresher. Um, some of you are brand new to the field and could use um, some expansion of your knowledge on these tools. So we're providing um, a modular um, set of courses that are free on demand so you can access them at the point at which you need the reinforcement or refreshment or expansion. Um, we'll talk about the, the modular um, design in just a second. And it really is designed to hopefully facilitate your administration scoring and interpretation of the WJ um, suite of assessments. So basically, no matter where you are in your practicing journey, um, you will be able to access content that will be relevant to you um, in terms of the, the, the need that you have um, to understand whether it be basic administration and scoring or more advanced sort of interpretation of the assessment. So they are, as I said, divided into modules for each test battery, which sort of allows um, the user to, to locate the, the learning course that is most applicable to their professional development needs. Um, and then they include, if you are more of a, a, a trainer or a supervisor, they do include knowledge checks that you can sort of assign um, your 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 staff, as well as supplementary resources, um, assessment service bulletins, some content that was specifically created for these modules, et cetera, to sort of supplement understanding um, in certain areas.
So, so the sort of the design of the program uh, for the COG is, is, is divided into five modules. So you have your introductory module that, and we'll look at that one in more depth in just a minute. And then you, you have your core test, which talk about sort of how to administer, how to score some frequent errors that are made on each of those tests any additional considerations or clarifications that are needed for a particular test. As we know, some um, tests are a little bit more straightforward and easy to administer, and some are, require a little bit more um, practice. Um, and then the same as approach is taken for those selective tests. And then modules four and five really focus in on those interpretations. So looking at the composite and cluster scores that you can generate and what they mean and those variation and comparison procedures. And then module five really digs a deeper into sort of making meaning and understanding the scores um, that you get on those tests. Because we know that at the end of the day that the standard score doesn't tell us really what the student can and can't do. Um, and it does certainly give us any kind of model or guide as to what to recommend, but really understanding and interpreting and, and analyzing that, that profile of scores is really what's gonna have the most impact for those stu that student because that's what's gonna lead to the changes that they need in order to be successful. So just looking more, a little bit more into depth and so to give you an idea of how these modules are sort of broken down, module one of the introduction of the test really takes a look at that CHC theory, which does form the, the theoretical foundation for the WJ suite of assessments. What materials come with the test? Um, what common uses, usages there are, use cases, what, what you might be able to use the test for, as well as sort of an overview of, of what tests are included. And then we talk a little bit about establishing rapport because we know, you know, the more comfortable a student feels with us, the more likely we are to get valid data out of our assessment. Um, digging a little bit deeper into the test record, basils and ceilings, testing by complete pages, any special considerations for those tests that are timed or tests with recording that you might have to um, pay attention to, and then talking about observations during administration as well. And then each, again, module has a list of resources that are associated with it that will supplement your understanding or allow you an opportunity to investigate a certain area a little bit further. So that's sort of how it's broken down. And so what we're really trying to do is make sure that, you know, as you're gonna be conducting these selective testing, using this selective testing approach, it's super important, as Dr. Steven said, to really know what the test tests. And so to sort of have that uh, a free on-demand access to these training modules will help you sort of get as much information as you need to be able to apply the selective testing measure method as, as efficiently as possible to sort of help facilitate um, your testing practices. And this is a great option too for many of the, you know, university programs. Um, we're hearing that a lot of our university programs are going online and offering online instruction. So having access to these uh, mo these training modules will be a great uh, resource for uh, professors to integrate into their um, their training programs. So here's our contact information. There's been a lot of questions coming through. We're not gonna be able to get to all of them today. Again, please join us on Friday. Feel free to reach out directly. Um, I know there's been a lot of questions about the RPI. And so um, we do have some resources related to that, but I think it looks like that would be an interesting area to explore a little bit more with it with a sort of a standalone um, short webinar on what it is how you incorporate that into mm -hmm. how you get it to show up on your score report and then how you might incorporate that into a written report um, to sort of help explain the students um, proficiency in a certain area and that is something that dr holman and i really want to we want to hear from you guys in the field with regards to what types of resources you need to make your job more efficient. If you're training university students, if you're in the field, we wanna hear from you. What do you need? That's what we're here to help 
we love creating things. We love, we love providing resources to help you um, use the products in a more uh, efficient way. Um, and we do want to hear from you with regards to topics like the RPI training. What other topics do you need training on? So as we move forward through the rest of the, the school year, get started, we're going to be providing some um, additional webinars um, on different topics. So hearing directly from you what you need uh, will help us with our planning um, of those webinars as well. So we want to make sure if we're spending, if you're spending your time with us, that you're you're spending your time getting information that is valuable to you. A couple of questions about the training program. Um, there will be a version that's for the public sort of practitioners um, available on the website. We are coming out with some uh, significant enhancements to our website within the next few weeks. Um, there will be a version specifically for university professors that is compatible with LMS systems so that you're able to use if you're required to at your university required to use an LMS um, that will be, you'll be able to use that version of it. Um, it will be available hopefully by the end of the month. Our, our goal is to have it available as close to the start of the semester as possible. So look for that very soon. And I love Susan's recommendations here. She says another topic uh, of interest would be testing the limits. I totally agree. Integrating that dynamic assessment into our practice is so important. Um, so we'll add that to our list as well. Absolutely. Where may I get a sample of the WIP reports? Is that on the website? Can they download that? Yes, um, and I have access to everyone's email that attended and I will, okay. I will email that directly to you. And I know there was a question also for some sample RPI into the report and we'll again plan an RPI session, but I will also send out a specific example to the person who asked for that. When would the RPI training be? As soon as we can get it together. <laughs> when do you want it to be? <laughs> is the question tomorrow. tomorrow. Right? Uh, is cognitive testing also included as part of the walkthrough for selective testing process? So each of the solutions, um, I'm not sure if they're referencing the solutions or the selective okay. testing process more broadly, but yes, there is there is the selective testing table for the cognitive assessment as well. And it also the sort of the selective testing um, is incorporated into the sort of cognitive aspect of any of the assessment solutions. Okay. Okay. Looks like we got right. most of them. Um, also, you have our email address, so please feel free to reach out directly to us, send us any ideas that you have, anything, any resource ideas, webinar topics, we'd love to hear from you. And, you know, we will definitely incorporate um, your needs into our planning as we move forward through the school year. And really appreciate you joining us and wish you the best uh, school year. Um, and again, reach out anytime uh, you might need um, something from us. Thank you, everybody, and um, please join us tomorrow. We're focusing in on early childhood assessment with some um, a couple of really great speakers um, about using um, the Battelle in your early childhood assessment, and then also those skills that are specific um, for those early childhood assessors, what they need to know um, to conduct those very particular evaluations. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Have a great, Have a great day. day.